Hi, my name is Alfonso Sinjago, and this presentation I will cover why openness will benefit the University of Minnesota. This, this week was Open Education Conference 2012, and next week is Open Access Week. And one of my first experiences with online learning was familiarizing myself with the OpenCourseWare Consortium and the MIT OpenCourseWare, where they made all their courses open in 2001, um, most of the course content. Openness since has grown into a much larger universe of initiatives, similar to how technology is embodied in the Techium, openness embodies a lot of different open elements, from open textbooks to open access to open source, open hardware, open science, and here are some of them. There are a couple courses that have been taught recently, and again, this is all facilitated because of the increased connectivity that we have through technology, and it's affecting courses. you probably heard of MOOCs so far. David Wiley is one of the main voices within this group, as is Wayne McIntosh, and there are other books such as Taylor Walsh and Anya Kamenet that greatly in, in good detail describe some of the events that have been happening. So uh, openness begins in 2002 within education with the UNESCO mentioning what open education resources were. But, and, and since in 2012, they passed the open education and a declaration for it. But uh, openness begins actually with um, open source software, much earlier than that, and Linux and um, the GNU licenses. And in Minnesota, it will help it at the university in the sense that by increasing openness, we can bring knowledge to other parts of the state, the nation, and the world. And as a research one institution, we want to get the information that we produce and the debates that we have to a, a, the largest audience that we can reach. Open access embodied in the Budapest Open Access Initiative since 2001. They have tried to promote free online scholarship. Again, the upcoming week is Open Access Week. And it involves how can we make it so that journals um, are able to not put their knowledge behind a gate, but the ones that an article is published, especially the ones that are federally funded, they're available for anybody to be able to benefit from. Journals' costs have increased rapidly, and the university libraries, for example, are helping now with a fund to encourage uh, publications in open access journals. There are many open access journals within the university. Uh, one of the ones that I have the privilege of participating with has been reconsidered in development, where I'm one of their web editors. And it's a student-run journal, has very low running costs, and I mean, it's available for anybody to benefit from. Another initiative that, you, that we could benefit from, and we are starting to benefit from, is open textbooks. As you can see, textbooks have increased in price much faster than inflation. This is something similar to open access. And many students, because of this, do not buy all their textbooks. And students spend an average over $1,000 a year in textbooks. To s ameliorate or reduce this problem, David Ernst in the College of Education has created the Open Textbook Catalog. And increasingly, this catalog will be filled with more books, and the goal is for them to be reviewed by faculty members and the way they can influence both traditional learning, online learning, and informal learning. These books are available both in a digital format or um, in print. And the Open Courseware Consortium is one of the other ways that uh, openness has affected online learning. Again, this started with MIT, but many universities, including the African Virtual University and the China Open Resources for Education, have joined the Open Courseware Consortium and has benefited millions of students. One of the most recent developments, which began, it depends on what you consider a MOOC, but one of the first ones, probably the ones that George Siemens and uh, Stephen Downs uh, promoted in Canada, and they have a site called MOOC.ca that has a list of them. There are various types, network-based, task-based, contact-based. Some call, um, there's the division between connectivist MOOC and non-connectivist MOOC too. But, and these are being explored by the university right now, in cultivating change in the academy, Right now, we are part of the higher ed um, community, trying to open co open online course, trying to. Um, and then we also have another benefit that has been brought by openness to education, especially online learning, which is the benefits brought by open ideas. TEDx is a great example of this. Ken Robinson, for example, in how schools create creativity, already has almost thirty million views and RSA animate and with increased smartphone penetration more people can create these videos. As we know from 
Aaron Dorian's Tech Talk, um, open videos are also benefiting the University of Minnesota. And we hope that this continues to happen. The more ideas that we can share, the more that uh, the knowledge that is created within the university, within the tower, can be brought to the rest of the world. And that's what the book the Tower in the Cloud from Richard N. Kantz is about. And remember that the goal of this, of having open innovation, is that the more that ideas clash with each other, as Steven Johnson argues, the more we can um, create better ideas and create more innovation and benefit society in general. And we're increasingly more connected globally. So open innovation at the UMN is already happening in some places. There was a design thinking higher education um, gathering recently. But we need to even increase more connections. We need to break down the silos, as the picture over there shows, and build more, focus more on solving problems and design labs. And I think uh, we can learn from some other schools that have had similar initiatives in this, uh, in this regard. Also openness, again, openness brought because of increased connectivity through technology, such as Twitter and Facebook, Uchahiri, um, can help increase access to information, increase awareness, and increase dialogue and debate, and the quality of policies of or how accurate they are in fulfilling the constituents' needs. Open government at the University of Minnesota is, I would argue, still in its infancy, but within part of GAPSA, for example, the Graduate and Professional Student Assembly, we have shared most of our policies and documents in open Google Docs so that people can comment and we're thinking of doing that with love. There's some institutions that have done that with GitHub. And all of this is what I consider openness and how it can influence learning courses by content or by the course itself. And we can't be afraid of this disruption because by being aware of the disruption, we can anticipate and um, be part of the